Greetings. Do what thou wilt shall be the whole of the law. I'm Lexi Eve, and welcome back to another video. Today I'm going over a topic that I really enjoy, and it's going to be the magical retreat and retirement. So, I really love this topic, and I love doing retreats. They can be used for many purposes, from attaining a grade or ascending the tree of life, to incorporating some idea or energy into your being, or just simply to ground yourself. In my past decade of practice, over that, I've performed several retreats and was all the better each time. But what are they? What is entailed? I'll begin by defining these terms, speaking about my own experiences undergoing retreats, and then go over one of Crowley's best examples of a magical retirement. To begin, a magical retreat and retirement I believe to be the same thing. Perhaps it's only semantics that make them different. What could separate them would be their length of time. So let's say a retreat is up to 48 hours and a retirement is anything over that. The point is, you are withdrawing from the world, either literally or figuratively, into your own being to do practices most of the day and or night. So I would say that basically once you have withdrawn as a hermit to focus entirely upon magical work for an extended period of time with no break for mundane concerns whatsoever, then you are doing a retreat. There should be an itinerary of constant rituals, meditations, and study of books specific to the retreat. Nothing less, nothing more. Going in, you should either be under the guidance of a teacher or have mapped out every single thing that you intend to do for a designated time, or else you could go into a retreat until a specific goal is reached and vow not to break the retirement until that goal is attained absolutely. There are, however, exceptions to the rules. There often are, as the Lima is not so black and white in all ways as the Osirian schools once were. Sometimes what one, w what one needs does not follow the above guidelines. You may need to blend necessity and practicality into an area where the two merge, and so long as the end result is attained, it matters not if every subcode of the bylaws and rules and definitions are adhered to 100%. After all, the key to joy is disobedience. But the way to mastery is to break all the rules, but, to, but one must know them fully to be able to transcend them. We could see in John St. John, Crowley writes that for s such a retreat, quote, the scene should have been laid in an inaccessible Lamarsai, which is a monastery of lamas, in Tibet, perched on stupendous crags. One should really have an attendant sylph, and one's guru, a man of incredible age and ferocity, should have frequently appeared at the dramatic moment. But, my good friends, this is not the way things happen. Paris is as wonderful as La Sa, and there are just as many miracles in London as in Luang Prabang. The universe of magic is in the mind of man. The setting is but illusion even to the thinker." End quote. So, Crowley may just define a retreat of retirement much like I did, but bar in some instances solitary hermitage, mandating that the mind of the magi be focused upon 100% of the time as the main purpose of the work, regardless of what you are doing with the body in what's surrounding. After all, in the Book of the Law, you could read the passage about hermits of the new aeon. But this requires discipline. Better yet if the person has mastered dharana and achieved dhyana at the very least, for then it is guaranteed that their mind is disciplined enough not to fall prey to distractions. You see, rather than holding a tatwa still in their mind, they are holding their mind focused solely upon the retreat, retiring within the part of the mind that is doing their practices for the entire duration. Again, this is a very advanced level of practice. Crowley was an adeptus exemptus at the time of John St. John, and not one who got their grade because they sat around paying dues and kissing butt for long enough. No, he was an adept who earned their grade, and yes, there is a big difference. As you will see shortly, he had no itinerary or knowledge of why he was doing this retirement in this case. He just intuitively knew he needed to do it. And he wrote a record to help the reader map out the grade he was in at that time. More on this later. Next off, I feel I should mention the term operation. In a way, there is a gray zone where the idea of a magical operation and retreat intersect. However, for an operation, while it is a series of specific practices performed over a designated length of time, you go about doing your ritual, rituals, etc. at the correct times necessary, but in between, you go on with your normal life. I would say that you could perform a magical operation during a retirement. 
Say, for example, you have the means to vow to go into the Abramelin operation and not come out of hermitage until you have attained knowledge and conversation with the holy guardian angel. Then in that case, yes, this operation would be performed during your retirement. Otherwise, you can do the Abramelin operation's mandatory practices at the necessary times, but in between, go about fulfilling life's necessities, such as going to work or shopping for food. In that case, it would not be a complete retirement. So this is how I define retreats. I think most would agree. Alistair Crowley, in his wealth of published material, has left us several ma magical retirements that, like a well, instead of water, we could draw wisdom forth. I wanted initially to take up analyzing two of these. His Paris retirement covered beginning to end in John St. John, and either the La Lake Pasquini retirement or the Esopus Island retirement. But due to space, if I did that, I could not also go into my own examples of magical retreats and retirements, so I have opted to only cover his parish retirement, as he was still a grade below the abyss in Exemptus to Demptus 7 equals 4, and that may be more relatable to a wider audience than the other two retirements performed during his initia initiation to the grade of 9-2. So now, with the intro out of the way, I want to go into my own examples. I will cover my very first retreat, a 48-hour block of practices under the guidance of my late teacher, William Allen Wheeler, Mage Wuffa. Then, I will cover one of my retirements, a 12-day retirement based on the Wheel of the Zodiac. Alright, so here I am going off script for a little bit. My very first retreat, like I said, was under my teacher at the time. Now, why I went into this retreat was because I was going back to school. Uh, this was in 2015, and I dropped out of high school some years before, and I was gonna start attending college within just a few weeks. At the time, I was living with family, and it was a very toxic environment, so I was constantly under stress due to just things going on with my family and very much boundary issues. Um, I was also approaching the beginning of my transition, so there was that added stress. I was very focused on my magical discipline, and in my mind, anything that was going to perhaps take time away from my spiritual magical progress was dreadful and really scary to me. So all of this stress was adding up in a very toxic way, and I began to have not anxiety necessarily, but I was just overwhelmed as it was and adding college which I did not do very good in school um, growing up I mean I was smart but I just never applied myself so I didn't really get all A's all the time and high school I did not care about school so now as an adult or a young adult at the time um, the idea of going to school is terrifying so I, I was borderline anxiety, I guess you would say, but I was just very stressed out about the whole thing and not really knowing how I could put it into words now. I couldn't identify exactly what was coming from where and how to organize it. So my teacher, the way he operated, he listened to what was going on and he had a very good idea of where I was at in my life, in my spirituality, in my magical career. And he, after listening... Uh, I was about to go around in a circle and start venting all over again. And he's like, whoa, 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 listen, we have work that you need to do. Um, I listen to you. I could give you my feedback, but we've gone over that and you probably know how to deal with a lot of that stuff on your own. But I'm not going to go around in a circle with you. I could offer you this. It was a Friday. He said, starting as of midnight tonight, I could take you on a 48 hour retreat. And I think that by the end of it, you will come out and have a way better mind state about everything, especially school after it's done. So that's my offer. Otherwise, we're going to table what you're going to repeat to me that you just told me and we're going to move on to other stuff. And so I paused and I thought about it. I didn't have too many plans for the, or anything for the weekend. So I said, yeah, right away. Yes, let's, let's do it. So great. Um, he we did our other work over the phone. I got back to my life stuff for the rest of the afternoon. Uh, I prepared, let people in my life know that, hey, I'm not around this weekend. I, I called off plans. And he went about setting up what he wanted me to do, the itinerary. Um, now, this was blind for me. I didn't know what practices were going to come when and what was necessarily going to be doing. 
Um, but we talked um, later on that evening, and he said, so at 12 o'clock midnight, you are going to repeat basically something along this line. I'll, I'll paraphrase off of memory. Uh, I'm looking at my other retreat. Um, yeah, so you're going to put your hand on a copy of the Book of the Law on your altar, and you're going to intone, I declare a magical retreat, but you're going to intone it. Um, there were some other things said. And then at the end, you're also going to intone, I will come out of the cave guarded and warded in 48 hours. Um, so that's pretty much my chosen way to start a retreat. Uh, of course, I've done other ones where that was not the, it wasn't so much about the length of time. It was more about um, what I needed from the retreat. But for a 48 hour retreat like this, um, I'm going into a cave guarded and warded for X amount of time and I'm not coming out of it. He said, because I lived with my grandmother, I would see her from time to time, but let her know, don't really approach me. If you see me going back and forth to go get something, uh, supplies out of the kitchen for ritual, just, um, but also be very kind to her and there will be some downtime for yourself. You are going to be kinder and nicer and gentler and of service to her when you interact with her. That is very important to humble yourself in that capacity and be of absolute service to anybody that you interact with that is not part of this retreat right? Um, be a servant. Okay, I could do that. And he said, so we're not going to do practices tonight. You're going to call it a night. It was midnight when I gave him the call that, hey, I did this um, intonation. I had my hand on the book of the law. This is started. He said, good, go to sleep. There's no practices tonight. You're going to wake up a half hour before sunrise and you're going to video call me. So I did that. I was up. I video called him and it began from there. He said, good. Have yourself breakfast, and from sun up till sundown, you're in solar fasting for the next two days. Great, so that's good. No eating for the next couple days. That helps me because I like fasting anyway, and I guess he knows that or he knew that at the time. Um, but I think that's just his method. So it helps me get into a trance state. Um, the denourishment when the body starts to eat off other stuff that's in the body already. For me, it's good. I like fasting, uh, and I'm healthy enough that I could do fasting for extended periods of time. I've done three-week fast, solar fasting. Um, anyway, so after breakfast, I immediately called him back, and we started doing practices from sun up till sundown when I was allowed to have my dinner. Um, we did a lot of stuff. Now, I was living in a very toxic environment, so one of the big practices that we did was invoking several angels. And then focusing upon, and it had to do with parts of the soul and the elements. So setting up circle casting and elemental uh, pentagrams with drawing them with actual physical elements. And then focusing on my altar that was in my temple. Um, no, my temple was my bedroom and I had the ceiling painted like New Eve. And I had all magical stuff all around. Um, just to give a little bit of the setting. Now, for that... Um, focusing for that ritual focusing on the altar at the end of it after the archangels are invoked and everything's been said and done um, using the altar as a focal point to create a bubble of astral light that extended around my temple to give me a very safe space that all of the negativity in my household could not breach and for the years that I lived there I really felt like that never broke down that permanent astral bubble um, stayed which was really cool uh, we did a lot of heart chakra workings. One of them was sex magic, where um, masturbation slow down when you're about to go over the peak and orgasm and then pull back and then come to the peak again and pull back and do this as many times as you can for about an hour if you can until you get to the point that you're trying to hold back and you go over the mountain anyway. And so this was to actually consecrate my tarot deck, which I had not done yet. And so collecting the ingredient X, um, male body parts at the time, male organs. So collecting the ingredient, mixing it with auburn melon oil, about um, half of, half auburn melon oil to what was collected, mixing them and then dabbing a finger and around the edge carefully of each and every single tarot card, anointing them. And this is after invocations and other visual meditations similar to uh, Circulation of Light, which is on my channel. And then after the deck was fully anointed, taking the rest of the ingredients. When, now, this took about 25 minutes just to anoint all the cards very slowly and carefully not to damage them. But then, So I, it creates a very meditative trance state. 
plus all the other rituals I had been doing up to that moment. This was now after, late afternoon the first day. Uh, and then take the rest of it and anoint the heart chakra. And I felt a vortex open on my chest and really just like, it looked like an astral tornado kind of propel outward and light just came in and kind of like was protruding from my heart. Uh, and I felt it like a vibration, like boom, blast open. You know, that was one thing we did. So it was literally do a practice, call him about the results, do a practice, call him about the results. I also sat down um, as part of, this was a practice in its own way, and I plotted out on pen, with pen and paper, which is my way to, um, I like lists and I like visual seeing things, writing them. I like writing things and seeing what's been written. So creating a day-by-day sort of dry sketch of what my life was going to look like with school added into all of my other responsibilities and taking the time to do that with him and then making sure our practices get done and my phone call with him gets done and other responsibilities that I had in my life all get done. Yeah, it would take an extra two hours plus an hour transportation there and back for each class. It was two to four classes a week and then an hour of homework a day. You know, it added up to, you know, I'm going to lose probably, you know, 10 to 20 hours. But for what I was getting, working towards uh, an associate's degree, it was fine. And it still left me with enough time that I could do my practices if I was dedicated. And seeing it on pen and paper, for me, that helped ease my mind. We did a lot of other practices. um, And now I'm going to just skip past because I would have to look through my records and it would take a lot of time to analyze each and every practice. It was just ritual magic, 45 minute ritual onto the next, 45 minute ritual onto the next, half hour ritual onto the next, and with calls in between just to get the next one and to talk about how it went. And there was good HGA communications, there was Hadith was present, there there was a lot of good things that happened. Um, One other really powerful moment During my break on the second night, after doing all of this ritual fasting for the two days and being up from before sunrise and uh, only on a couple hours sleep, I was on my dinner break and I had an extra half hour to myself before we got back into the nighttime practices. And so I was sitting in a recliner, just whatever was on the TV, I was just relaxing and my cat was on the arm of the chair and suddenly two balls of astral light, probably about the size of a softball or so, came floating out of my bedroom, which was behind where I was sitting, and floated through the room very slowly and kind of just sat in the living room where I was. And my grandma was there, she didn't see it, but the cat sees these two astral lights float by and he looks at them and then he does like a double take at them. And so I see him and I'm looking at them and I just start giggling like, oh my God. Now I was a more green um ritual magician at the time so to see that was really cool to me i had never seen a ball of astral light float out of a temple um while i'm doing this heavy work and so seeing that um i kind of was happy that hey this is working and you know let me call william and get back into this i want to do more um and i had written him a text the day after all of this was done Um, I made it through the 48 hours of practices. It went absolutely amazing. And my text to him the next day was, hey, I felt like I was in like one of those fairy tales you read as a kid where things are really magic and you grow up and you realize, oh, the magic isn't real. Well, for this 48 hours, the magic was real. All of the things that I saw, like I felt so good and my aura the next day was made of gold and it was rock hard. Um, my mother is very, very toxic and she was living downstairs for me at the time. She actually came up and tried doing one of her things where she argues and I couldn't help but just laughing and not engaging. And I could feel as I'm seeing a gold aura around me, her like bad energy, just like ping pong right off of it and go under undetected another direction like bounce off and I, it made me laugh even more. And I wasn't trying to laugh to insult her. I was laughing because wow. Somebody who would come and be hostile and aggressive and argumentative around me all the time is trying to suck me into it, and it's not working because I had fortified and I had done this practice. I felt really good about going to school, and going to school, I ended up getting straight A's anyway. Um, It was the best I've ever done in school, and things were good. So that was my first experience with a magical retreat. 
And so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to several years later, after William Wheeler had died, Mage Wolf had passed on, and I had done my first magical retirement. Okay, so at this point, um, William had passed on, and I had wanted to do this retreat based on where I was in my magical career. I was solitary. I had left OTO and um, other orders that will remain nameless. Um, I had left them, and I was pretty much solitary. Uh, I don't think that I had joined LIL yet, but I was going there. Um, and so I ended up getting a communication from a spirit called Ara Karth that I was working with. And it basically told me, hey, you know that retreat, that retirement you've been putting off? It's time you do it. So pick a day and start. Um, it was the first week of August when I got that communication. And I wanted to do this on the Wheel of the Zodiac, so I picked August 8th to do, August 8th, 2018, to do a, so 888, uh, to do a magical retreat based on the Wheel of the Zodiac. Now, in my mind, I had the idea that this is going to be about the 12 Zodiac with the sun in the center, the ego surrounded by the Zodiac, and that these things are one in that sense. They're one operating vehicle of the universe. Um... Part of it, uh, I would be in my temple from sun up till sundown, solar fasting for all 12 days, and I moved my bed out, so I was uh, sleeping on my yoga mat, which for that extra discomfort for a spiritual gain, I was also under the Enochian tablets, which I had activated at the beginning of the retreat for the next uh, 12 days, which was really, really heavy to do. And also, I had a unique idea of plastering the 12 zodiacal cards uh, using an app to locate where the zodiac signs were at 12 a.m. And then three to four times each day, doing the 12 zodiacal greater hexagram invoking ritual. And I would rotate the 12 cards just before invoking the 12 zodiac hexagrams. So it was almost like doing Libra Resh, but for the zodiac. And I got to see how the zodiac circles around us, which was really, really cool to be the center of this zodiacal wheel that was floating around my temple with me in the center of it. So each day there followed from day one, Aries, day two, Taurus, all the way through day 12, Pisces. Um, so I took time that first week before, like it might have been the second or third, I was starting on the eighth. I spent the next several days mapping out what practices I would do on what day. So just to give an example, um, for the day of Aries, um, I wrote down day one on my itinerary. Aries, fire, Mars, ram, energetic side of Mars, emperor, bodhisattva. So I took the bodhisattva vow. I did yoga specific to um, probably the root chakra, I believe. I did Liber Stelle Ruby. I did the Cry of the Dirt Aether. I was working with the sixth Enochian call, Fire. Uh, I did a very unique invocation of the 72 names of God. I was doing Liber Israfel every night at sundown before I went to dinner as an added extra like, okay, I'm going to power through this. Yes, I'm going to be hungry, but I'm going to do an extra practice before I allow myself dinner. I did um, the ritual of the congregation of the lamp of visible light, which by itself is very heavy. Now I was doing it under Enochian tablets in a retreat context. Uh, and then in between I was doing yoga and William had died and I had a portion of his ashes and periodically I would go into either the hanged man position or shavasana and I would have his ashes next to me or I would sit in the god position or another yoga posture sitting up and I would do as long as I could in asana visually with my eyes open meditating upon his urn. Um, so that's an example. So this followed the 12 days. Um, and there was one day out of the week because I had my fiance, who was then my boyfriend. I allowed myself to go visit him just to say so 12 days is a long time to be away from a partner. So I told him prior, hey, this is going to happen. I need to do this, but I'll have this one day that we can meet up. And I chose the day of Libra since it's a day of balance um, to reset the scales. But I still had practices to do. Uh, I just wasn't going to do them at my temple space. Um, I was doing them here basically uh, in his apartment 
huge. So I remember that first day also uh, for Libra Stelle Rube, I did a whipping, uh, actual self, um, I guess you would call it flag, flagellation, flagellation, um, it's basically whipping myself as that, I, which is not part of the ritual necessarily when it says swelter and make the roses bud. Um, that's not what it's actually talking about, but I, I chose to use that as part of um, the Liber Stelle Ruby. So it was sort of like a little Opus Day or like an old Franciscan friar monastery um, what, during that part of the ritual. Um, I did a lot of sex magic. There was one day, uh, might have been saturn the day of saturn and it was cool because that day i had ordered a book like a week or so prior and it didn't come but it was um the book from the collected works but it was the solitary one that has the invocation of hakate i forget the name um orpheus probably so i received a copy of orpheus a red hardcover with just that play in it and so i allowed myself at nighttime at 12 midnight to go out to a fork in the road which is several blocks away from my house at the time to bring a, a bowl filled with offerings drop it at the crossroads kneel down at the and this was in like a factory area completely dead like a bad part of town that you don't want to go to several blocks or maybe like and they're like there's one sketchy dive bar and factories and it's like past midnight so give this offering and then as i'm doing that i start to hear dogs barking um i heard people behind me but i don't think that there was anybody there which was really freaky and i was just vulnerable doing this ritual which if anybody did pass by they would see somebody giving offerings at a fork and fork in the road or at a crossroads uh thinking i'm like a satanist that could go any number of terrible ways in a christian society they're not the most peaceful of people um and then after giving these offerings um and asking for i forget exactly what it's in my notebook um I had to then, like Orpheus, not look back. So until I got into my grandmother's apartment where I was living at the time, back where my temple was, I could not look behind me. Otherwise, I'd take on a terrible, terrible karma and she would have my soul was the mental intention. So that there, it was like doing um, almost like a sort of Diana or not Diana, Dharana. You know, it was a concentration of the mind, but with very high stakes. Um... I remember Frater Achad in one of his journals would not at work raise his arm above his waist. So it was very much like that. Do not look back. And I kept hearing dogs barking behind me my whole way home, like four, five, six block walk. Um, I kept hearing dogs and I don't think that there was any there because I didn't see them as I was walking and I wasn't going to turn around. But I made it home. Everything was good. Uh, there was a lot of divine names. I was doing that, it seems, every day, looking at the script here. It, it was a unique invocation of the 72 names. Um, there was one day, I'm not exactly sure which it was, I had just scrolled through my notebook from that retirement, and I noted down every thought that I had and every, you know, uh, practice I did in full detail. I, I journaled it methodically, but I was just flipping through, and um, there was one day where... I had sat down and in a two-hour period read Libra 888, the Gospel according to St. Bernard Shaw. I read that in one sitting in two hours. Um, also, I should mention, before the retreat started, it was the evening of, I had stepped out on my stoop for a few minutes. It's like an elevated stoop that goes up to the second floor, and I was living on the third floor, private house uh, in Brooklyn. And as I stepped out on the stoop, two bolts, one and then a second later, another one, not even five to ten feet away from me, just came poof, crashing down right in front of me in my gate. And I stood there a little bit shocked that this happened leading up to the retreat. Um, focus on the Wheel of the Zodiac and Zeus and connection to Kether. And it was, you know, so cool to see two massive lightning bolts out of nowhere. Just as soon as I came outside and stood there for a moment, boom, boom too also um that was really really powerful and so i had begun this retreat similar to how i um began the one with william only i also took an oath which um i declare a magical retreat for 12 days i shall retreat in accordance with the zodiac um i give myself leave to take care of my errands on the day of libra and to make adjustments in my mundane affairs 
The next line, verse 3 of my oath, I will not say because it's personal. And verse 4, I will remain within my temple as often as possible, performing works outlined here below and appointed by experience during the retreat and studying works that pertain to the work at hand. And then I intoned, I will come out of the cave, guarded and watered in 288 hours. Um, so yes, basically practices all day and all evening, getting about four hours of sleep a night. Very, very, very dedicated. Um, I was doing a lot of sex magic, like on the day of Capricorn, uh, day 10, invocations of Pan, 11th degree, uh, receive jelly uh, with the intention um, on... I'm not going to tell you the point of this retreat, what I was hoping to get from it, but what I was the goal of the retreat was my intention... Um, with that particular sex magic operation or most operations so yeah it was basically just day in day out doing rituals assigned to that zodiac sign and also shifting the cards um like i had said so becoming very attuned to the zodiac one by one by one day by day um and so at the end i invoked uh, on the on the 12th day at exactly 11:55 p.m i began the final invocation when this was going to end and so that was a ritual that I wrote, an invocation of hermaphroditus. And so as part of it, I did a 12 zodiac sign invoking hexagram ritual. And for the, this time when I did them, I saw within each hexagram the animal's head of the zodiac. So for Virgo, I saw a female head. For Leo, I saw a lion head. For Aries, I saw a goat head, a ram's head, floating in midair right in the center of the hexagram with my physical eyes. This was on the astral plane, but they were physical, tangible, like I have never seen the astral life before. They were that friggin' dense. Um, and that was like, to me, proof or evidence that this retreat worked with the intent that I wanted it to work, that I had raised that much energy that this really did bring something new to the table for me, and the energy was that potent, so I had done this correctly leading up to this final invocation. Um, there was one other interesting thing that happened um, for anybody into low spirits. I realized after this happened that I didn't do any low magic aside for what I did with Hakate which some people feel like she could be a very malignant or dark entity um, in certain contexts she could be very unforgiving at the very least or night side of the moon even but I hadn't done any low mercury or low anything clefaltic spirit goishic there was none of that in this retreat <clears throat> and so one time I did Libra Israfel and I didn't do a pentagram banishing before I did it Maybe that was the cause, and it was, but anyway, so I do Libra Israfel, and I do this thing at right before a pause when I'm calling um, to Asi, and when I'm invoking Asi, the curved one, where I open the gate of bliss by giving the sign of Dominus Liminus, uh, the opening of the veil, the rending of the veil. And then I, after I invoke her, I sit silently, and I was seeing a physical, like a Celine or a Diana-looking female being invoked every time I did that. Like, I would open the doorway, and I would see her walk through the doorway and into me as I invoked her. This time, I'm sitting down for the ritual for that part of it, facing west, and all of a sudden, I hear this sound, like, in my left ear, and... I start thinking, what the hell is that? And then a couple seconds later, I'm looking forward and it's complete pitch black, no candlelight or anything in my temple, and it was nighttime. And all of a sudden, these glowing, I think they were green eyes. Uh, I have a picture on my notebook that you could see on the screen now. I saw these green eyes, not four or five feet away from me, because my temple space was not that big. It was maybe a seven by five or seven by ten room or something like that. Um, so five to ten feet away from me was this shadow dragging looking entity with a human body it had like a dragon head like the horns but short horns and like a very lizard type snout and these either glowing red or i think they were green eyes and i could see them staring at me and then i could see it saying the whatever it was trying to tell me and i'm th i had a sword next to me but it was wrapped up and in its scabbard and i'm thinking oh do i pull out the sword now i'm at that pause 
um, in the ritual, so, oh, crap, what do I do, like, this is really awkward, and I'm now here with a demon, and it's physically present, and it's not bound, um, shit, <laughs> and I was not scared, but I'm just like, oh, crap, this is not good, and I'm thinking, well, I summoned it, even if I didn't intend to, I did it by accident, I'm responsible for it being here, I'm not gonna insult it by enslaving it, or threatening it, I'm just going to sit here for a second, and okay, that's about long enough. I'm going to close the veil, and when I close the veil, it completely disappeared. But it made me really nervous. Um, now, I would realized, thinking about why did that happen, well, I didn't banish, but I've been banishing so much. I honestly think that it was because I didn't do any low aspects of Chachmo or Mercury or anything that I was working with. Um... I was working very much with the path of Beth and the path of, uh, and the sphere of Chakma. Uh, I don't think that I did any low magic and that's why it came. It was kind of like the retirement balancing itself out. It's like, okay, you didn't call anything low. You've only been working so high. Here's some low energy just to kind of balance you out to, and it'll be one big experience, non-threatening, but it'll be big enough that it activates what it should activate to kind of balance out this retirement to give you the full spectrum of the experience. And I think that that's basically what happened. Um, and everything was fine. Nothing bad happened. I paid attention to my life and what was going on. There was no bad experiences that came up um, any time after. So yeah, I honestly think that that's what did it. But it was really cool after the fact, once I was safe and everything was good and it was gone. But at the time it was like, oh crap, this is crazy, <laughs> you know? Um, so that was my retirement. Again, practices around the clock. This one with a specific intention. The other one was more for balancing my life out and protecting um, my emotional space and my physical space and giving me a little bit more power in my life and uh, stability emotionally at the very least if not physically um, so this one was different I had a specific goal I'm not going to get into that but um, I saw the goal kind of come to fruition in many different ways and still be working in my life at this time and uh, yeah just fasting and focusing on things that had pertained to the topic uh, of the zodiac and um, yeah it works so now what I'm going to do is I'm going to switch over to the very last topic and I'm just going to cover some of Crowley's John St. John really quick. So for John St. John, what was the purpose of this retirement and is there a general schematic that I can fish out of it to see what methods were employed to attain that goal? So in the proof face, Crowley writes, quote, Our happiness depends upon our state of mind. It is the mastery of these things that the magicians of today have set out to obtain for humanity, end quote. A few lines down, Crowley addresses those unaccustomed to magic. He describes the schools of the past who were so excited by realizing the ability to summon mere apparitions. They would delight in realizing that they could evoke a demon, never getting the point of understanding that magic is the art by which we could transcend all, raising ourselves up to the highest. Today, thankfully, in light of the Book of the Law and systems of attainment outlined by Tomegatherion, we understand the follies of those I previously described and have the means to use magic to search ourselves, record diligently everything about nature, internal and external, and thereby know and understand self and God. We can know happiness. Quote, Therefore, we set out diligently to explore and map these untrodden regions of the mind. End quote. The first step towards mastery. The next is achieving discipline of the body and mind. He addresses the reader again about the contents of John St. John, quote, You will perceive in these pages a man with all his imperfections, thick upon him trying blindly, yet with all his force, to control the thoughts of his mind, so that he shall be able to say, I will think this thought and not that thought at any moment, as easily as, having conquered nature, we are all able to say, I will drink this wine and not that wine, end quote. For, as we have now learned, our happiness does not at all depend upon our possessions or our power. We would all rather be dead than be a millionaire who lives in the daily dread of murder or blackmail. Quote, our happiness depends upon our state of mind. It is the mastery of these things that the magicians of today have set out to obtain for humanity. They will not turn back or turn aside. End quote. <clears throat> Aside from that, in the opening paragraphs of the prologue, which Crowley follows the preface with, he says about the purpose of this magical retirement, quote, Previous records of mine have therefore seemed vague and obscure. 
even unto the wisest of scribes, and I am myself afraid that even here all of my skill of speech and study may avail me little, so that the most important part of the record will be blank. Now I cannot tell whether it is part of my personal comma, or whether the influence of the equinox of autumn should be the exciting cause, but it has usually been at this part of the year that my best results have occurred. It may be that the physical health induced by the summer in me, who, dislike damp and chill, may, being forth, as it were, a flower, the particular kind of energy, which gives alike the desire to perform more definitely and exclusively the great work and the capacity to achieve success. So then, in the last days of September 19, do I begin to collect and direct my thoughts, gently, subtly, persistently turning them one and, to the, and all to the question of retreat and communion with that which I have agreed to call the Holy Guardian Angel, end quote. But even by the third day of the retirement, Crowley still didn't have full conscious knowledge of, about what the purpose of the retirement was. Quote, I failed to apprehend the true magical purport of my work, end quote. Now, I just quoted a lot, I know. But I felt it necessary and the best way to explain exactly why Crowley undertook this magical retirement. It seems he had months prior moved his magical equipment to Paris and just instinctively knew he needed to do this. By this point in Crowley's magical career, he had already attained knowledge and conversation with the Holy Guardian Angel. His glimpses were either happenstance or forced and fleeting. He hadn't yet experienced the constant omnipresence of the HGA. On day four of the retirement, he reflects on this fact and comes to the conclusion that he truly desires the HGA in the most intimate ways. Quote, I do indeed ask for a knowledge and conversation of the Holy Guardian Angel. I want the perfume and the vision. I want that definite experience in the very same sense as Abramelin had it. End quote. So at the time, he was of the grade of Acceptance Ademptus, 7 equals 4, and it was October 1st to the 13th, 1908. He knew he was approaching the abyss, and unfortunately... He did not have anyone living who had the experience of practicing the hermetic occult sciences and crossing the abyss that he could bounce ideas off of to help him plot out his strategy. He was in thoroughly uncharted territory, and so I believe a part of this retirement was in his mind to help him reach Bina. This, of course, happened a year later in Algeria during his scrying the 38 ers but I'm certain this all had some great effect upon him as an adept nonetheless. He was driven by his by the need to help humanity, and the pages on which he recorded this retirement are yet another example of how he was trying to help others by clearly outlining his great work. So we know the purpose and what led up to Crowley intuiting that he needed to take a magical retirement. What then does it entail? This retreat had 13 days recorded. As stated, he is not in complete isolation and actually goes outside for lunch and groceries frequently. We see that he seems to record everything, literally everything he does and thinks, even things that may seem trivial, as I will speak about momentarily. He says in the preface, he has the idea that he will start off slow and each day build up momentum of will. Some practices he does consistently include asana, pranayama, mantra, cutting a cross on his breast over the heart, Libra pyramidos, and the bornless one. I'll go more into his practices and then cover a few of his best experiences during this retirement. And finally, I will close with what came of it. Now, this is how he begins his retirement. I myself think some statement of purpose is universally mandatory, as I showed in my own retreat and retirement. When you speak about something in a magical context, you are vibrating on the astral plane and beyond. You are creating something. Abracadabra, I create as I speak. Thus, you are awakening your spiritual body and binding yourself to a practice. This has a definite effect. For this particular retirement, Crowley began it thus, quote, Quite slowly and simply, therefore, did I wash myself and robe myself, as laid down in the Goetia, taking the violet robe of the exempt adept, being a single garment, wearing the ring of an exempt adept, and the secret ring which had be, hath been entrusted to my keeping by the masters. Also I took the almond wand of Auburn Melon, and the secret Tibetan bell, made of Electrum Magicum, with its striker of human bone. I also took the magical knife, and the holy anointing oil of Auburn Melon the mage. I began then, quite casually, by performing the LBRP, finding to my great joy, and some surprise that the pentagrams instantly formulated themselves, visible to the material eye, as it were, bars of shining blackness deeper than the night. 
I then consecrated myself to the operation, cutting the tonsure upon my head, a circle, as it were, to admit the light of infinity, and cutting a cross of blood upon my breast. Thus were to admit the light in, and infinity. And cutting the cross of blood upon my breast, thus symbolizing the equilibration of and the slaying of the body, while losing the blood, the first projection in matter of universal fluid, the whole formulating the ankh, the key of life. I gave moreover the signs of the grades from 0 equals 0 to 7 equals 4. Then did I take upon myself the great obligation as followed, I, O, M, a member of the body of God, hereby bind myself on behalf of the whole universe, even as we are now physically bound unto the cross of suffering, that I will lead a pure life as a devoted servant of the order, that I will understand all things, that I will love all things, that I will perform all things and endure all things, that I will continue in the knowledge and conversation of my holy guardian angel, that I will work without attachment, that I will work in truth, that I will rely only upon myself, that I will interpret every phenomena as a particular dealing of God with my soul, and if I fail herein, may my pyramid be profane and the eyes closed unto me. All this did I swear and seal with a stroke upon the bell. End quote. So he then knelt in the thunderbolt position of Asana, attaining body rigidity while his eyes were rolled back toward the third eye, which is a method of Pratyahara. Quote, my tongue was rolled back in my mouth and my thoughts radiating from the third eye. I strove to shut it, shut in unto an ever-narrowing sphere by concentration, concentrating my will upon the KC of the HGA. Then I struck twelve times upon the bell. With a new month, the operation was duly begun." End quote. So, as I said, this retirement went on for thirteen days. Thirteen is the value of the word achar, unity, and ahebiha, love, by Gamatria. It can represent the sun surrounded by the twelve zodiac signs. Gimel is the thirteenth path, and Gimel connects Tifereth to Kether by going up the middle pillar, straight through the abyss. There are thirteen paths above Tifereth, which are called the Beard of Macro Prosopis. By adding the number of the first thirteen tarot cards, zero the fool through twelve the hangman, which is sigma zero through twelve, it adds up to seventy-eight, the total number of tarot cards in a single deck, thus implying unity and completion in another way. 418, the value of the word of the aeon, Abrahadabra, becomes 4 plus 1 plus 8, which also equals 13. So, October 1st, the diary begins at 8 a.m. He dons his robe and meditates a little before going out for coffee. Quote, 1045, I have driven over to the Hammam through the beautiful sunshine, meditating upon the discipline of the operation. It seems only necessary to cut off definitely dispersive things, aimless chatter, and such. For the operation itself will guide one, leading to disgust for too much food and so on. If there be upon my limbs any chain that requires a definite effort to break it, perhaps sleep is that chain, but we shall see. Solviter ambulando. If any asceticism be desirable later on, true wariness will soon detect any danger and devise a means to meet it and overcome it. End quote. Yes, Crowley is definitely going off of intuition to operate this retreat. It doesn't seem like he has too much plotted out other than a somewhat generalized and foggy idea of an outcome. Quickly, throughout his days, quickly throughout this day, he does asana pranayama for 11 minutes, 10 seconds to breathe in, 20 to breathe out, 30 seconds to hold, another 7 rounds of pranayama, 3 hours later after a nap, after a 5 minute break due to his body hurting from asana, just after the last 7 rounds of breathing, he does asana for 10 more minutes. Then immediately switches to the hangman posture for 20 minutes. He says he is feeling worn out and out of shape practice-wise, quote, I feel, such a, feel like such a worm, able only to remain a few minutes at a time in a posture long since conquered. For this reason, too, I cut again the cross of blood, and now a third time I will do it. And I will take out the magical knife and sharpen it yet more, so that this body may fear me. For that I am Horus the Terrible, the Avenger, the Lord of the Gate of the West, end quote identifying his being mentally with Horus. <clears throat> he then reads Libra Pyramidos, does a tower reading about this retirement, but this is all written um, in some brief notes about not feeling well and that he is very disconnected from Adonai, the HGA, which really bothers him. The divination was not recorded, unfortunately. 
He goes out a few times this first day for groceries, and a friend brings over a seemingly unwanted third guest. Once more, he, quote, cuts a cross of blood, uh, once more to a firm mastery of body, sat down at 11.49, and ended the day with ten pranayamas, which caused me to perspire freely, but were not altogether easy or satisfactory, end quote. So day one has ended. He's struggling with even simple practices, which he has previously mastered. I didn't mention it, but I'll get it out of the way. On day one and elsewhere later on, he goes out to eat, ordering oysters and notes, chewing them thoroughly and very slowly. Doing so releases a certain chemical, which actually gets one drunk if done correctly. Oysters have a high level of zinc, which also raises the libido, increasing one's sexual appetite. So for these two reasons, I understand good and well why he decides to chew down oysters. Now, just as a silly side note, um, although even before I was vegetarian, I disliked oysters immensely. Clams are nice, baked clams, but oysters are just too big and always served raw. It makes me think uh, of what it must be like to gulp down a coffee cup of snot. Um, sorry, but yeah. So he recites the spontaneous invocation of oysters on the third day, quote, O oh, oysters, be ye unto me strength that I formulate the twelve rays of the crown of Hua. I conjure ye very potently command. Even by him who ruleth life from the throne of Tehuti unto the abyss of Amenti, even by Ptah the swathed one, that unwrappeth the mortal from the immortal, even by Amun the giver of life, and by Kem the mighty, whose phallus is like the pillar of Karnak, even by myself and my male power do I conjure ye. Amen. End quote. Note this passage as I feel is very important. Quote, also, since others are to read this, one must mention that almost from the beginning of this working of magic art, changed aspect of the world, whose culmination is keeping the oath I will interpret every phenomena as a particular dealing of God with my soul, was present with me, end quote. <laughs> so this line plunges one into the abyss. It is no idle term, and is a lifelong binding oath. Every phenomena must be interpreted through this lens, for the rest of the life of the magician who swears at him. Think about how big this truly is. <clears throat> what is a phenomena? Anything that cannot be classified by signs falls under such a classification. Well then, considering there's a factor attributed to every particle, an unknowable thing, sometimes called consciousness, but truly what is beyond that, it is the creation factor or God particle that I refer. The cause of all particles to exist and what governs all laws of science forcing the universe to remain intact and tangible, like what caused the quilt to be knitted and halted intact, but more so in this case, as it is the thing which caused the person to exist and willed to knit the quilt in the first place. Well then, by this definition, everything is a phenomena, as it is unknown how any of the near-infinite particles of the universe came to be, and what forces beyond the physical realm governs their existence. So then, every single thing which happens as, and is within the sphere of the magician's five senses is a phenomena, and every single thing they perceive is a constant communication of God, which they are bound to contemplate, interpret, and understand as a direct dealing of God with their soul, guiding them onwards towards union. For a person not ready to deal with this level of responsibility, and to truly understand all of chaos, well, this can drive one completely mad. Now, I felt it necessary to explain this part of Crowley's oath. Though it is a lifelong thing he since day one must do, it is new to him at this time, and he is in a retirement focused solely upon magic and yoga, so he is even more attuned to the oath while inducing altered states of consciousness. Just keep in mind that all day long, while focusing on his retirement and practices, he is working double time, also operating this verse of his oath. Days 2 and 3 are basically the same as day 1, so I'll skip over them, as he does the same practices, albeit a lot of them, as well as self-reflection with many deep and interesting thoughts noted. These practices were the same. Asana, Pranayama, Mantra, crosses cut on his chest over the heart, Libra Pyramidos, the Bornless One, invoking Adonai, and struggling each step of the way. Though on the third day, aside from the oyster invocation, he does give us the hymn to coffee, which I have used innumerable times myself over the years, and I cannot recommend more for coffee drinkers who would add an extra spiritual spark to their coffee experience. Quote, O coffee, by the mighty name of power do I invoke thee, consecrating thee to the service of the magic of life. 
Let the pulsations of my heart be strong and regular and slow. Let my brain be wakeful and active in its supreme task of self-control. That my desired end may be effected through thy strength, Adonai, unto whom be the glory forever. Amen without lie. And amen. And amen of amen. End quote. We can see each day that some new moments of vigor and strength begin to come to Crowley, especially after day four. But each time the clouds pass and the sun seems to shine, he falls back to a state of discontent as though new clouds quickly swept away hope of light and warmth. On day, f on day four, he makes the same rounds of practice and writing self-reflections for the reader to learn from. But at 10.50, he writes out a skeleton for a new ritual he means to perform. Based on how he felt, he claims at 1.40 p.m., days 1 through 4 may correspond with uh, the great signs of Adeptus Minor. On day 1, he was slain. On day 2, Isis cried and he was elated. On day 3, Apophis triumphant, and he was in a devilish mood, writing, quote, 5.50, the mantra still ripples on, and I am so far from the path that I have a real good mind to get Marit, which was the unwanted guest, to let me perform the Black Mass on her at midnight. I would add just lo I would just love to bring up Typhon and curse Osiris and burn his bones and his blood. At least I now solemnly express a pious wish that the crocodile of the West may eat up the sun once and for all, that set may defile the holy place, that the supreme blasphemy may be spoken by Python in the ears of Isis. I want trouble. I want to say Indra's mantra till his throne gets red hot and burns his lotus buttocks. I want to pinch little Harpocrates till he fairly yells. And I will, too, somehow. End quote. Then on day four, Osiris risen. He feels great and full of life. He performs a lot more asana, mantra, and pranayama periodically with more self-reflection and another day ends. Over the next few days, he continues on with the same practices, heavily performed over and over. Many times he is still in a bad way, mad at the world of man for their ignorance and struggling with much of what he thinks and does, trying to place himself in some formula or other, and he cannot even do that. Is he in the Apophis phase of EIO, when things are gloomy, or is it one of the other formulas? He cannot decide. I could go on for hours picking apart everything uh, from this ret re retreat or uh, retirement, but that would not do the topic justice. So he comes up with some truly creative things that you should definitely read and reflect on at times when you may feel similar especially if you practice magic and go through a period where you're not feeling good life seems hard and practices which are usually easy seem impossible it does happen from time to time just know that despite how he feels and underperforms he does stick it out really trying and doing a ton of yoga and ritual magic and prayer and other similar things Without much of a clue as to what he should be doing specifically during this retirement, his one saving grace is that he has begun focusing his mind more and more upon the HDA and latches onto it. He accepted that this then is what is drawing him and must be his will to attract the HDA, and to do so, he would have to be a pure vehicle for it. He also knows that his passion is for writing, and so to attract the HD in a new way, combining his will to have Adonai, as well as be a writer, he combines the ideas by swearing an oath which doubles as a pact for aid from the HDA. Quote, I swear by thyself, O thou who art myself, that I will not write save to glorify thee, that I will write only in beauty and melody, that I will give unto the world as thou givest unto me, whether it be consuming fire or a cup of wine of Yacchus or a glittering dagger, or a disc brighter than the sun. I will starve in the streets before I pander to the vileness of men among whom I live. O oh, my Lord, Adonai, be with me, give me the purest po posy, keep me to this vow. And if I turn aside even for a moment, I pray thee warn me by some single chastisement, that thou art a jealous God, and that thou wilt keep me veiled, cherished, guarded in thine harem, a pure and perfect spouse, like a slender fountain playing in thy courts of marble and of malachite, of jasper, of topaz, and of lapis lazuli. And by my magic power, I summon all the inhabitants of the ten thousand worlds to witness this mine oath." End quote. I think this is very interesting as he allures the HGA with a pact that also allows him to be aided to do his will in several ways. Skipping forward, by days 8 and 9, he is very devout to invoking the HGA and doing things to mentally concentrate upon and activate the third eye. He performs a ritual renouncing of his former grades and all things, and receives a vision which he also refuses. 
He claims all of his enemies attack him, the mind in various forms, quote, the petty affairs of the day, even the irritations of his body, the emotions of him, the plans of him, worry about the record and the ritual, and oh, everything, end quote. Yet he withdraws from all of this and calls to the HGA immediately. He continues on with constant yoga and invocations more and more, and in his time between practices, he is writing and reflecting upon his nature, hardly wavering at all. By the end of the ninth day, he, the last entry reads, quote, Adonai, Adonai, let it be written of O.M. that the Lord Adonai is about him like a thunderbolt, and like a pylon, and like a serpent, and like a phallus, and in the midst thereof, like a woman that jetteth the milk of the stars from her paps, yea, the milk of the stars from her paps, end quote. Still, just as many practices, if not for longer periods each. Now, by the opening of the eleventh day, I would like to say that things have gotten better. Quote, I did 21 breathing cycles without fatigue. Energy returns, end quote. But, as the day progresses, his practices are fatigued and painful, at least mentally, and his body does become ill. I feel this next entry is important, as this retirement... Though Crowley had to struggle through most of it, produces passage after pass passage that if you read, you will see humility, honesty, self-reflection, and guidance through the initiation of an adept through the tree of life. So it almost becomes that this retirement is less for Crowley and way more for the reader, that it is all in active service in his own way, which is truly an interesting twist. Take this quote from 2 or 5 p.m. on day 11, quote, it also struck me that this operation is, among other things, an attempt to prove the proposition. Reward is the direct and immediate consequence of work. Of all the holy illuminated men of God of my acquaintance, I am the only one that holds this opinion. But I think that this record, when I have time to go through it and stand at some distance to get the perspective, will be proved a conclusive proof of my thesis. I think that every failure will be certainly traceable to my own damn foolishness, every little success to courage, skill, wit, tenacity. If I had but a little more of these, end quote. Does he get anything out of it besides that? Yes. He needs clarity on this stage of his path, and he learns that he doesn't have a road map and what that entails. All of the yoga, if done in small bursts, always adds up down the line. And most importantly, he stays true to calling and working with his own HGA. We can all learn from that, especially when the chips are down. This, from day 12, absolutely sums up the success of the retreat. Quote, Then, subtly, easily, simply imperceptibly gliding, I passed away into nothing, and I was wrapped in the black brilliance of my Lord, that interpenetrated me in every part, fusing its light with my darkness and leaving there no darkness but pure light. And I also and also I beheld my Lord in a figure, and I felt the interior trembling kindle itself into a kiss, and I perceived the true sacraments, and I beheld in one moment all the mystic visions in one, and the Holy Grail appeared unto me, and many other inexpressible things were known of me. Also, I was given to enjoy the subtle presence of my Lord interiorly during the whole of this twelfth day. Then I besought the Lord that he would take me into his presence eternally even now but he withdrew himself for that i must for that i must do that which i was sent hither to do namely to rule the earth therefore with sweetness ineffable he parted from me yet leaving a comfort not to be told a peace the peace and the light and the perfume do certainly yet remain with me in the little chamber and i know that my redeemer liveth and that he shall stand at the latter day upon the earth for i am he that liveth and was dead and behold i am alive for evermore and have the keys of hell and of death i am a moon the sun in his rising i have passed from darkness into light i am a sar unnefer the perfected one i am the lord of life triumphant over death there is no part of me that is not of the gods the dead man ankafna kansu saith with his voice of truth and calm o thou that has a single arm o thou that glitterest in the moon i weave thee in the spinning charm i lure thee with the billowy tune the dead man ankafna kansu hath parted from the darkling crowds hath joined the dwellers of the light opening down to the star abodes their keys receiving the dead man on Kafna Kansu, he hath made his passage into the night, his pleasure on the earth to do among the living. Amen, amen with thou lie, amen and amen of amen. End quote. On the thirteenth day, there is just a single entry that 
saying that he will, quote, abide in the silence, end quote. A good place to be. Now, in closing, we know from other writings that Crowley thought this retirement sealed his claim to be a master of the temple. He later then realizes that he did not truly attain the grade until about a year later, but perhaps this was a precursor or just a way of reconnecting with his practices and the HDA, of going deep into a series of practices to gain some sense of stability at a time when his path was unclear. Coming out of a retreat or retirement always feels amazing. I myself am always reconnected with my body and mind in a more positive way, and I'm certain it was so for Crowley. Retirements. A way to stop focusing on the calamities of the world and go deeper within ourselves to gain a new power. That is what they are all about. I do hope you decide in the future to undergo one. Perhaps you have a teacher who will guide you, or perhaps you will create an itinerary of your own. Or maybe just start one up and allow yourself to follow the current, doing what practices arise and seem fitting. Whatever the case, follow your HGA and the light, and you will not be led astray. Love is the law. Love under will.